the, the topic of this, the theme of the conference is the exploration of nature perception. And there are two notions of exploration. One that comes from sages, from all traditions, have been pointing to that the nature of this reality, the nature of experience in the world is illusionary or maya, meaning that illusion doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but it means that it's not what it appears to be. And your science today is giving us the complex information about the complex processes that are happening in our body and organism and brain of how we construct um, what we call outside world and reality and also inside experience. On the other hand, our immediate experience is very real, is very tangible. Is there a way to, how can we reconcile these two levels, two notions of experience? Maybe we can start with you, Hamid. I don't reconcile them myself. <laughs> I'm heavy with them being two different alternatives ways of experiencing reality. There is the ordinary, dualistic, scientific point of view, which is valid and it's ground and develops further, further ways of experiencing things. And there is a more a spiritual perspective, which is experiencing things more immediately, directly, not through microscope and telescope and all of that, but in our own immediate experience of consciousness and being. And maybe the two sometimes meet on can meet, but uh, the spiritual perception uh, itself doesn't really require the scientific confirmation or explanation, and uh, it, my own sense is that our it'd be good to have a scientific confirmation only if that helps other people. Uh, be open to the direct perception. Can you just cl clarify what do you mean by spiritual perception? Meaning, I mean, there are different ways of having spiritual perception, and I think since uh, here we, uh, we're um, focusing on non dual, perception then is an immediate uh, awareness of. Uh, phenomena and recognizing that the phenomena themselves are awareness, are expression of awareness. And uh, me and the phenomena are all manifestation of the same awareness, the awareness that is aware of this uh, field that uh, we call environment. So this is, uh, I will call that a kind of spiritual uh, perception because it is immediate and there is a recognition both of the immediacy, the, I mean there's no filtering and uh, oh, both mind and who knows, maybe there's not even filtering of brain but probably brain is involved somehow. But the idea is that it's, um, There, there's an awareness of a, uh, of a knowingness that is uh, luminous in the, both in terms of light and in terms of knowing. It, it is uh, uh, self-revealing and bringing about understanding in, in an immediate way uh, that does not involve thinking. Rupert, what, what's your, is there, is there a need for reconciliation or is there, where do these two perspectives come together? Or are they separate? Or? Science is quite right in telling us that the world is not what it appears to be. In that sense, it can be said to be an illusion. However, each of us here knows that our experience is not an illusion. It is real. Whatever it is, 
experience is real. So the question is, what is real about our experience? Because all anybody ever knows is their experience. Whether you're a nuclear physicist, uh, whether you're having lunch, whether you're having a deep samadhi, uh, whether you're in a deep depression, all we know is our experience, and experience is undeniably real. So what is its reality? And by what criteria are we going to judge whether something is real or not? So I would suggest there are three criteria that reality has to satisfy. The first is that it cannot appear or disappear. Because what would it be before it had appeared and what would it become after it had disappeared? So something that is real must always be real. Rea secondly, reality cannot change. If it changed from one thing into another thing, then it, it would, each of those things would not have their own reality. And the third, and in some ways the most important test, is that whatever is real must be known by itself. If it is known by something other than itself, then it is relative to that knowing entity. So, for instance, reality cannot be dependent upon the mind. It is not something that can be known by the mind because the mind is not always present. It disappears at the end of every thought or perception. So, whatever is real must know itself. So the analogy for something that doesn't appear or disappear and something that doesn't change would be if you take uh, H2O in three states, of water, ice, and gas. The, these, when, when ice forms in a bucket of water, nothing new comes into existence. The, the ice just gives the water a new name and form. So the reality of the ice is the water. It's not something that comes and goes. So what is it in our experience that satisfies those criteria? What is it that is independent of the presence of the mind? What is it that never disappears, that always remains the same, that pervades intimately all experience, that, that gives ex experience its reality? It, it, it is pure consciousness. Can we still call that our experience? Well, it, can, it's, can, can we talk about no something that can be known? The moment we say known, there is already a knower. No, but it, what's important to understand is that it is consciousness that is conscious. It is awareness that is aware of awareness. A, a body mind is not aware. It is awareness that is aware. It is, everything's is, everything is awareness is experience. There, are, there is no other entity present to have an experience. A, awareness is the only experiencing element. So what I'm hearing, you're pointing that even the essence of body-mind is awareness. Go Can, to your experience. What, what, what do you know of a body-mind? What is your experience now of a body-mind? Sensations, perceptions, my heart beating. Okay, take your heart beating. You experience that as a sensation. Yes? Now, if, if you were to reach into that sensation and ask yourself, what is the actual substance that is present in that experience? Do you find anything other than the knowing of it? No. When you look out at this room, do you find anything other than the knowing of this perception. In, in other words, pure knowing or pure consciousness is the only thing that you think that you ever experience. And you 
are the consciousness that experiences yourself alone. Yeah, so Aruba, you're saying that everything can be reduced to knowingness. That knowingness is the fundamental ground that imbues everything. Yes, except that I would put it the other way around. Instead of starting with everything, yeah. presuming that there is everything, and yeah. reducing it back to knowing, yeah. I would simply start with my experience, yeah. which is the knowing of my own being, the yeah. knowing of being. I would start with that and then ask myself, do I, do I, do I knowing, ever leave myself? Do I ever come in contact with anything other than myself? Do I ever find everything, or something, or nothing? And the answer is no. I, awareness, am aware of myself alone, eternally. And all of this is, is a modulation, an ever-changing modulation of this never-changing knowing. I think that makes sense to me, in the sense, fundamentally, we are an awareness that is aware of its transformation, of its own transformation. We can say I'm aware of a chair or whatever, but in reality, we only have the awareness, it, which is only awareness, it, our awareness. Exactly. Right? And I, I have a question about that. I mean, I understand that. that Experience is knowing and awareness. Experience of anything is knowing and awareness, and you could conceptualize in scientific ways, whatever, but we're really left with our own experience, with our own our awareness. Um, you seem to uh, uh, use the word awareness, consciousness, and knowing interchangeably. Yes. Are, you, are they all for you the same thing, or do you make some distinction between them? I don't make any distinction between awareness, consciousness, and pure knowing. Mm -hmm. Okay, because sometimes uh, there is awareness and there's no knowing. Y yes, in the sense, uh, you know, there's a, there's perception, but there's no knowing of what that perception is. There's no yes. cognition in it. Would you include that in knowing? I would say that awareness's fundamental experience yeah. was simply to be itself, and that to be itself is to know itself. But it's yeah. not the knowing of itself as something. Yeah. It knows itself in the same way that the sun illuminates itself, just by being itself. But, but then that very dimensionless awareness yeah. vibrates within itself and appears as mind. Yeah. And it's in the form, or personal consciousness, it, yeah. it's in the form of mind that awareness can seem to turn away from the knowing of itself and to know something other than itself called an object or a world. I'm focused on the, the knowingness of itself. Yes. Right. Uh, isn't it possible that sometimes the knowingness knows itself without knowing itself means there is awareness, right, a phenomena and awareness of the luminosity of awareness without the knowing, that there is a knowing of awareness, without the concept of awareness. There's well, just of course there is pure perception, and there is no mind that says this is perception. Of course, the, there's awareness is knowing of itself without a concept. Without, yeah. But if I were to ask you the question, are you aware? What would you say? I would say there is awareness. Okay. Right. Okay. And. There's a awareness okay. and of, uh, of phenomena, of no, appearance. No, but, but the question was not, is there awareness of phenomena, yeah. but is there awareness? In this moment, are you aware? 
Yes. Okay. So At this moment, I say aware, but I can be in a place where I don't know I'm aware, no, even but, though but, I'm aware. But talking about this moment, this let, moment let's yes. stay in this moment. Yes. So if I ask the question, are you aware? Yeah. You respond yes. And you respond with absolute certainty. Yes, there is awareness. I am aware. Yeah. Now, where do you go in your experience to get that yes? Don't go anywhere. But nevertheless, exactly, we don't go to a place, but nevertheless, it is an undeniable experience. Not an objective experience, but it is an undeniable experience. I am aware, or there is awareness. Now, what is it could, that could be aware of the presence of awareness? Only itself. On itself. So it's only awareness. that transparent, objectless, dimensionless, placeless place that we go to to answer the question, "Am I aware?" is awareness why, is knowing why of would itself. You use the word "I," because we're speaking of it, so we have to give it a name. So and a, "I" in our language speaking. is the name. Uh, we're conceptualizing it, so. Uh, the, the reason why I feel I is the best name is that I is the name that we give to that which is most intimate and that which has remained with us all our lives. Yeah. I was calling myself I when I was five years old and ten years old and twenty years old. Everything about my experience, including my body-mind, my sensations, my perceptions, my thoughts, everything has vanished and is continually vanishing. Yeah. But there is something uh, yes. that we call I. So it, it, it's a convention. Well, There's no... Robert, I have the same experience yeah. as yours. Yeah. I appreciate that. That happened at some point, there was just the I. But there came a time also when the I disappeared. When there's no I and there's no body. Awareness continues, like right but, but, this but moment. What I awareness call I, continues, but there's no I. No, but what, what I call no I is, is the awareness right. that continues. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't feel like an I, because I, 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 I realize, is an affect. Is, is an affect, is a feeling an of an I. No, but I'm not referring to the feeling of being. I'm referring, when I say I, I'm, I refer to what you call the awareness that continues. Of course, it doesn't continue yeah. in time. It, yeah. it is ever-present. No, what I mean, there are two ways of experiencing awareness, in my experience. I can experience awareness as I am the awareness. Uh, I, I am, am awareness. I, am aware. I can experience myself as I am awareness, where awareness and I are the same thing. Awareness is the true self. Or there's the experience of awareness without the sense of an I. There's the concept, the, uh, the word I wouldn't make sense. I think it was like, okay. if it when, I, when I. It sounds to me like a syntactic difference. I think what you refer to I is what Hamid thinks uh, refers to I am. Uh, or awareness without the I. Right. So I, what Rupert refers to I is just awareness. And for, as a reference, we call it I. The pure awareness here is first as I. That's what yes, I'm hearing. It's, it's just a and linguistic convention. I, I'm not attached to calling it I. <laughs> I'm happy to call it nothing or awareness. It's just that I feel that every word has an association with it, and that association brings certain limits. But, I, but that's good, and that's why I'm sort of emphasizing this book, because if you, if you use the word I, it has all kind of association. Mm. I yes. mean self for everybody. Mm -hmm. The moment we say I, everybody say we'll talk about that, you talk about yourself. And when I'm saying awareness, I'm not talking about myself. What about these but even though I can also experience I, I mean, I keep going back and forth right now. So I, I am the, the awareness as I talking to you and you're Rupert. And, and also that alternates with awareness that is nothing, okay. where there's no I and there's no you, there's nothing that is aware. Let's agree not to use the word I. I'm happy to use, not to use the, the word no, I. I, 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 don't, to use the I word don't dislike awareness. it. 
I'm yeah. just making a distinction yes. between two kinds I, I of non-duality. Let, let's agree on that. Maybe yeah. we can use I am and then awareness. Uh, and I would like to, let, let's explore, you have very distinct different approaches to the exploration of experience. And yes. Hamid, I think in your work, there is a lot of space for the exploration of the I am and the levels of experience of the I am, the conditioning, the, um, the appearances, the, even the meaning. You do invite people to inquire into that. And Rupert, um, I, I think in your exploration, I see more um, an invitation to, again, <laughs> I don't want to, uh, uh, invitation to to focus more on the I, on the pure awareness, rather than on the appearance of the I am. I would like you to both um, elaborate and maybe talk more about how you approach the, the exploration of nature of experience. And Hamid, maybe, or, or Rupert. Good way to do it, yeah. Once we believe, and more importantly feel, that what we essentially are is an aware being or an awareness which shares the destiny and the limits of the body, we cease to know ourselves as we truly are, which is unlimited awareness, ever-present and awareness. And we seem instead to contract inside the body as a, a separate knower of experience that shares the limits of the body. Now, everything that apparently separate self thinks, feels, does, the way it relates, depends upon this essential belief and more importantly feeling that it is a temporary limited entity. So almost all the problems that people face in everyday life, anxieties, fears, neuroses, difficulties in relationships, etc. All of these hinge on one belief and feeling, which is the belief and feeling that the knowing with which experience is known is limited to and by the body. So th this belief and feeling of being a, 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 temp a, a temporary limited awareness underpins everything the separate self thinks and feels and does. So it is for this reason that in, in this approach we tend to go straight for the for the root idea, the root feeling, this belief that I am a temporary limited consciousness. Once that has been taken care of, once that limited consciousness has been seen to be an illusion that is only real from its own illusory point of view, then all the problems that were downstream of that belief are gradually cleared up. That's, that's why in this approach we tend to go, it's why it's called the direct path. We tend to go straight to the heart of the matter. I think that's a, a very nice, concise way of, of um, uh, the Advaitic uh, inquiry, and which I fully understand and appreciate uh, the approach that happened, you know, uh, in this work that I do, is a, explore is a more general exploration. It is an, an inquiry into present occurring experience, whatever it is. What is the truth of it? Whatever the experience is. And what arises is the I and the self, and then becomes inquiry, what is that? Advaita just goes to that. What is, who am I? Which is a direct path. Uh, the approach that seems to happen in this path is that 
there is exploration of any experience, any present experience, and an inquiry in it. What is it? What is its truth? What is its fundamental? Is it really the way it appears to be, or is there more to it? Or there's something more fundamental about it? And that exploration to reveal things about many things, and one of the main things it, uh, it zeroes into and uh, understand is a sense of separateness that you, Rupert, mentioned, that we believe ourselves as an entity, identity, around the body, you know, and that is explored and understood, and it is basically peeled off through understanding little by little mm -hmm. to expose just pure presence, uh, pure beingness. Uh, but the recognition, also the wisdom, is that it is good to explore any experience, not just what is the individual, what is the I, although this is a, the I is fundamental, it's sort of the center of all experiences, but you know, the experiences of relationship, the experiences of uh, uh, the body, what is the body, uh, and then the experiences of, uh, the, of awareness itself, what is awareness? And so the inquiry continues, so in my experience, uh, the inquiry keep, con keeps continuing. The knowing keeps getting subtler and deeper. And for me, what I find is that knowing is always approximate, is always a, an approximation to reality, because reality manifests itself in approximation. There's something about the fundamental. I don't know what it, I'm not going to say it's awareness, whatever, the fundamental that is. Uh, inherently indeterminate. And it manifests itself as awareness or as consciousness or as body and all of that. And we could know it in all that way, but it is possible to, to continue inquiring and to realize consciousness, experience nothingness, awareness, and then finally he didn't get his, his uh, enlightenment until he experienced the sensation of all perception and sensation. And so there was no awareness, nothing, complete cessation, complete annihilation of experience at all. And that, that for him was the entry into the liberation from everything and then awareness emerged from that. So there, then I have that experience, I mean, my awareness encounter that cessation of the awareness, of the knowingness, and then there is an experience into what made that happen? Can I, can I get into the cessation itself? You see, is the cessation, like Dzogchen, for instance, the, the Buddhist non-dual teaching, says that cessation is a temporary experience, it's not as important. What's important is to recognize the ever ongoing empty awareness. And I always contend with Dzogchen, I said, yes, you're right. However, Buddha himself said cessation was fundamental for him. In my experience, cessation is fundamental because it really helps us encounter if there's any uh, remnant of fear of death, remnant of identification with the body, cessation tends to flesh it out. It has a usefulness, although it is a particular experience. But, but that, the cessation is an experience where there is no awareness. Can I ask you a question, yeah, Hamid? Yeah. Um, ab about this nothing that you speak of beyond or prior to awareness. Yeah. From your own experience, yeah. not from what the Dzogchen or the Buddhist or the Buddha or other yeah. people say, but from your own experience, what is your experience of that nothing? No experience. If you have no experience of, you, of it, how can you legitimately claim it to be? In, in, on what grounds are you speaking of it if it is not your experience? It, it's obviously not a belief because you speak of it with great conviction. Because but if it's uh, not there, a, there is a, seem, uh, a gap in experience. What is it that is aware of that gap? If you claim well, that the gap awareness in... emerges again from that gap, and we're just like from deep sleep, when we go in deep sleep, there's no awareness. But if you say awareness emerges from the gap, yeah. then it means that the gap 
had no awareness in it. Yes. So on what grounds are you claiming the presence of that gap? Because it cannot be your experience. Because there must be awareness there to say there is a gap of nothing. No, awareness can get, well, I could tell you how it started, which is, it was awareness, consciousness, conscious of itself. And at some point, I'm just that, and I was with my friend Karen, who was there with me, participating in the experience. And as I'm awareness, uh, the awareness aware of itself, and then the awareness became aware of some kind of emptiness, some kind of spaciousness. And then I started seeing as if the awareness began to disperse, becoming almost like islands or atoms of awareness that are surrounded by absolute nothingness, absolute darkness, no knowing, no, and then, and that continued to disperse until some point, pop, there was, I, there was no experience, and then awareness is like I fell asleep, and then I woke up, awareness comes with everything, and uh, asked my friend how long was, she says it was a few minutes, and then I asked her, what did you see happening? She said, you disappeared. But what was your experience when awareness disappeared? There was no experience. I'm only aware of the experience approaching that and coming out of it. But the, 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 within it itself, there was no experience. Absolutely total cessation of but, awareness. But in that case, on what grounds are you claiming it to this gap of no thing in the absence of awareness? If you weren't aware of it, how do you know it was there? Because as I mentioned, I was approaching it by seeing it pervading my awareness and annihilating it. Uh, that, that I understand. Little by little. Until at some point, and, it, and the awareness, uh, first I was aware of phenomena, then just awareness aware of itself and aware of this darkness, and at some point the darkness took over and the awareness ceased. But and if then you say, there if, came a but, time that after that developed where I can look back at that, I mean, in the moment I could look back I mean, similarly to the way in the Sagada Maharaj talks about himself, he said, if you, you open your eyes, the world appears. You look back at yourself, you disappear. Yes. That's, that's the experience. I look back, there's no looking back. Yes. I look back, I come back forward. Yes, I, under yes. I understand that yeah. you, there's awareness, aware of itself. You feel this uh, emptiness approaching, and at a certain stage, you say the awareness disappears and then there's a blank and then awareness reappears again and you look back on it. So you, awareness is present as you approach the blank, awareness is present when you look back on the blank. That yeah. I understand, it's like approaching deep sleep yeah. and remembering deep sleep but saying I wasn't aware in deep sleep. But what I'm interested in is not the approach to this, um, this nothing or the looking back on the nothing how do we know it's there? How can we claim it to be okay. real Very good. If, if, if we're not aware of it? Well, several things. That's a good question, I think. A very nice question. I appreciate that, Rupert. <laughs> and uh, because I ask myself that question, you know, especially the other tradition that says, no, forget about it. Um, first of all, my friend Ken was there. And I can ask but her about Karen that. cannot, valid, valid, c c cannot validate true. your it experience. It is my experience of her telling me that. Yeah, but that, that, that don't, I mean, yeah. if we're going to base our, our, our experience on what other people tell us, I mean, that's like somebody saying, you disappeared in deep sleep. In, uh, so can, it, it must be uh, your own you? experience, mustn't it? Yeah, but there, there's another reason. Sorry, okay, the other I reason, interrupted The result you. of that yeah. is that awareness after having that experience, awareness itself changed character. Awareness itself changed character so that awareness is, has no self-reflection. 
and yes. meaning that awareness doesn't reflect back on itself. And in that, also, the lack of self-reflection eliminated the sense of I. And that's why yes. it connects with the sense of I, because yes. I think well, that, awareness I can be experienced in two ways. Can be an awareness that's aware of its beingness, or awareness that's aware of its non-beingness. At the same time, there are two ways that awareness can be, and the non-beingness is selflessness, and the beingness is self, pure, fundamental self. I'm, I'm comfortable with both. So, um, and they both are awareness, but the, it seems awareness has two faces. I don't mean to, I don't mean to labour this, but it, it's very interesting what you're saying because it doesn't seem to be my experience. You yeah. say awareness is aware of non-being. Yeah. For awareness to be aware of non-being, awareness must first be aware, and it must be. If awareness was not present, it wouldn't be able to be aware of non-being. So for awareness, awareness cannot legitimately claim the experience of non-being. Well, you can say that, but there is the experience of awareness, aware of non-being, or the other way around, which is uh, non-being manifesting awareness. Our, recognizing that awareness is manifesting moment by moment, and that non-being is the fundamental source, which is not a source. That is manifesting awareness. So, in fact, for me, I mean, this is, we could go back and forth about this, because there have been debates in history about that kind of thing. But the uh, interesting thing for me about it is that if we uh, allow or recognize the experience of non-being, that can open up awareness in ways that we haven't envisioned but before. What would recognize the experience of non-being? You said if we can allow or recognize the experience of It is of always awareness. But then awareness must be in order to recognize it. Awareness. The, the word, as you, I know you know this very well, ness means the presence or being Awareness of. is aware of the fact that it is not something that is. It is not something. It is something. only a luminosity in knowing that cannot claim existence. But, but awareness knows itself. Knows itself not as something existing. Absolutely, not as anything uh, that exists, of course. And, but and nevertheless, not, it is. I am. Awareness wouldn't say I am. Of Awareness course. would recognize Can that I, I am is an approximation. Sure, yes. Yeah. We yeah. might be talking about the same thing in a different language, so I'm so. wondering whether we Can I invite we you? Meet. Maybe yeah. we can make this discussion really right now, right here, yeah. exploring the nature of experience in this very moment. And maybe, Rupert, you can start by how would you explore what, what is here at this very okay. moment in... Well, I could either go apparently inwards towards thoughts and feelings, but that would be a very private experience, or I could go, I could go outwards towards my perception. So let's go outwards because we're all perceiving what we call a, a room or a world or an object. So. I, I look at this that thought conceptualizes as a room or a collection of objects made of stuff called matter. Then I look more closely and I, I notice, no, actually, I never come in contact with the room. I just know my perception. Not a perception of the room, because we don't find the room. It's just perception. I just know perception. But then if I look more closely and ask myself, have I ever found an object called a perception? No, 
I've never found, I'm not experiencing a perception. It's more like a, we could call it perceiving. It's a verb, not a noun. So I then ask myself again, okay, this, this experience here, which is made of perceiving, if I were to try to touch the stuff that perceiving is made of, because perceiving must be made of something, even if that something is not a thing. So I, as it were, reach out an imaginary hand and try to touch the stuff that perceiving is made of. And all I find there is pure knowing. Not the knowing of something, but just knowing. Now, what is it that knows that knowing? Is it known by another source? Is it known by something other than itself? No, it is this knowing that knows itself. And if I then inquire into the nature of that knowing, I find it has, or rather it finds, when it looks at itself, when awareness turns its attention towards itself, it finds itself uh, luminous in the sense of made of pure knowing, pure sensitivity. It is empty of apparent objects. It is without dimensions. We can't even say, as you said very nicely in your talk, you can't even say it's not in time or space. Because that presumes that there is something called time and space that awareness is not within. But if we stay with awareness's experience of its own self, time and space never even come into existence. So this, this very experience that I and each of us is having now is made entirely out of this dimensionless, luminous, empty knowing. Yeah. Hamid, I, uh, I heard you say uh, that y there is space in your teachings for recognition in everything that is appearing in this pure awareness, being thoughts, feelings, emotions, um, I see like there are almost two ways of looking the nature of experience. One is through first realizing our true nature, the pure awareness, and the other approach is by step by step going through what's Im the immediate body-mind experience and through diving into that experience, seeing the transparency of it, seeing the pure awareness. Um, can you reflect on that or um, talk yes. about the, your teaching? How do you explore mm, that particular appearance in each moment of that pure awareness? There is a space for deep exploration of that. Well, I mean, you, you described it yourself. So, exploring any ordinary experience. If we explore it, we arrive at what Rupert is saying, that it is simply awareness, aware of phenomena which are not separate from it, and at some point we can be aware of itself as awareness, and knows itself as awareness. And I, I will say that is fundamental, this is the fundamental awakening, and also that uh, awareness can shed its cognitive dimension, its knowingness, and become empty of knowing in the sense there is perception without knowing that there is perception. Meaning uh, phenomena don't disappear but there is no cognition or recognition that anything is occurring. So I see knowing and awareness as two dimensions that awareness has. Knowing can have a cognitive dimension to it, which is knowledge, knowing. And then everything is knowing. And everything is knowing, in fact, chair is knowing, the person is knowing, everything is, is really manifestation of knowing. But also everything can be a manifestation of, of pure awareness 
And pure awareness, I differentiate, you know, experience pure awareness from pure knowing, in the sense, pure awareness is non-conceptual. By non-conceptual, I don't mean my mind is not thinking. By non-conceptual, I mean there is no recognition of what is perceived. Just like when you think of there a baby no at the beginning. They're looking at things they've never seen before. They don't know what they are, but they perceive them. There's no dis distinction, no they, separation. They, there are distinctions, but they don't know what the distinctions are. So I call that non-conceptual awareness. So there can be conceptual awareness or non-conceptual awareness. And non-conceptual, if you recognize the non-conceptual awareness, it is possible that awareness itself can become aware at some point of its non-beingness, that uh, it's emptiness or non-existence, which not actually uh, ascertain until we bring back the dimension of knowing the cognition. The cognition, can, with the awareness, can be aware of its emptiness, and it's basically a sense of transparency and, and uh, transparency of everything. But you see, the important thing about that, what I like about that, which the rupert that we might appreciate, is that awareness dis, uh, disposes of time and space, right? Doesn't need them. However, as we recognize the emptiness of awareness, we can bring time and space, and our, our awareness can extend, not just for the moment. Because awareness, usually, pure awareness is in the now. The now and pure awareness are the same thing. As, however, the, the now of this moment is the now of any other moment. So the now of awareness includes all moments of time. When we recognize that it is possible that awareness, I can be aware of you, right? But in the same moment as I'm aware of you, I can be aware of Ramana Maharshi. At this very moment, I'm aware of Ramana Maharshi. So awareness can extend through time because awareness, it's outside of time and space, but through its emptiness, it can bring back time and space and open them up completely so that awareness can uh, truly transcend time and space while time and space are present. So, uh, recognizing... The expression of awareness can transcend time and space, right? Because awareness is outside, is not yeah, dependent it, it, on time it's tra and space. Transcending it doesn't mean eliminating it, you see. It, awareness itself doesn't need time and space, but it can't function in time and space. And recognize that time and s uh, space are the way manifestation happen, the way phenomena happen. Is, has a way of talking about them as time and space. But that it brings a fluidity and a freedom of awareness for our awareness through its emptiness. That emptiness becomes like a wormhole into time where we can be aware of ourselves at this very moment or I can be aware of myself many years in the past or aware of myself in the future. So awareness suddenly expands to include all time and space. And that's what I referred to this uh, morning as unilocal realization. So, uh, uh, there is uh, an interest that I find in importance in recognizing first, uh, that's why I question the question of self, why it is self and then brought in the question of cessation or non-being, because that becomes an, an expansion of awareness for awareness to open up beyond to what awareness is usually in non-dual experience recognized as, as the nowness of the present moment. So is there, oh, is there, can we talk about realization without personal consciousness? Hamid, maybe you can start. Good question. <laughs> yes. Is that personal consciousness? If we can talk about realization without personal consciousness. 
or the appearance of person. If Kamit could start, and then uh, sure. Well, first of all, any realization is has a pers first personal character to it, right? Even though it is uh, my realization, I could say and I'm realizing I'm only experiencing my awareness, Robert really is just an expression of my awareness, right? Still, that experience is not Rupert. Rupert has his experience of realization. That, to me, Im implies an individual consciousness, not our own consciousness, an individual. That, consci that consciousness, even though it is uh, non-dimensional, it will have, will need an instrument, an organ through which to perceive. And that organ, I call it individual consciousness, which each human being, which differentiates each human being from another, you see, which makes also relationship uh, meaningful. I mean, it doesn't eliminate the fact that it's all the same awareness. But awareness functions through, I mean, it manifests its experience, but at also it manifests individual consciousness through which it can have perception. Because I don't see how perception can happen without individual consciousness, because perception is always located. I would um, describe it slightly differently from that. And I would say that awareness is the one that is aware of itself. And if we ask awareness, what do you know about yourself? Of course, awareness cannot reflect upon itself or speak, so I'm caricaturing awareness. But awareness's own experience of itself is that it is ever-present and without limits that it is not personal, that it is not identified with a set of limited thoughts and feelings. So in fact, awareness always only ever knows its own infinite self. So how is it possible then for awareness to seem to know something other than itself? In order to know something other than itself, awareness must rise in the form of the mind which is what I would call personal consciousness. Um, infinite awareness itself must take the shape of the mind. And as that mind, it can turn away from itself and seem to know something that is not itself, such as an object or other. Now, as that mind, in order to know an object, it must first conceive of itself as a subject. And awareness, infinite awareness, in the form of the mind, conceives of itself as a separate subject by identifying itself with a body. From that moment on, awareness seems to be, a, infinite awareness seems to become a personal consciousness made out of mind that looks out and seems to know a world made out of matter. So mind and matter are co-created when awareness seems to turn away from itself and rises as the mind. So this personal consciousness or mind, is, it's, like a, it's like a pregnant woman that is continually giving birth to itself and is as such both the mother and the daughter of its own creation. as a self-creating, self-perpetuating, self-validating, self-authenticating illusion. It is, a personal consciousness is only real from the illusory point of view of a personal consciousness. The separate self is only a real separate self from its own illusory point of view. From the point of view of the one who truly knows infinite awareness, it never ceases 
to be or know itself alone. It cannot come in contact with an object or another because to come in contact with an object, it would have to limit itself. It cannot do that. Awareness knows no limitation within itself. But uh, Robert, in your experience right at this moment, as pure awareness, isn't there perception? Yes. Your perceptions differ from my perception. Yes. What makes the what accounts for the difference? Because awareness has within itself, because its nature is inherently empty, it has the possibility within itself to arise as a multiplicity and diversity of but forms. You, you, meant, the, you, you made it sound that the only way for for awareness to individuate is to create a separate self. No, to create mind. To create mind, which you said ha sees objects what are separate. Uh, don't you think that in, in your experience, the present moment, that awareness isn't seeing separate objects? Yeah, exactly. Isn't it seeing separate objects? Exactly. So but there is perception. Yes, but when... But the, the perception is coming from this direction. But when, when the belief in being a separate... Before, limit... before there is a belief, isn't there possibly for their perception of everybody here without believing in a separate perception, it's a separate self? Yes, yes. And, and but, so what accounts for that perception? The, that is unique. The, 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 the fact that consciousness itself is, is, is empty and therefore has all possibilities within itself mm -hmm. and can take the shape of innumerable perceptions yes. at the same time. Yes. So, but, but, however, from the point of view of awareness, they aren't a multiplicity and diversity I of understand. separate... They're not multiplicity. They're all the same expression yeah. of so the same for instance, awareness. If you were the screen, if you yeah. were a TV screen, yeah. an, an aware TV screen, in other words, yeah. you are the screen that is, that is watching the movie that is playing on you, a, 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 a colorful a, a landscape appears full of trees and peoples and rocks and, and everything. Now, from the point of view of one of the characters in the landscape, the character looks around and sees a multiplicity and diversity of objects. But if you ask the screen, what is your experience? Do you experience any divisions within yourself? The screen says, no, I am one seamless, indivisible, intimate whole. And all of this all the different perceptions, all the different thoughts, all the different feelings are my own infinite self vibrating within myself, appearing as all these finite perceptions. That's very true. I, I understand that, uh, Rupert. The fact of it is that you're experiencing things that way, that is, as the screen experiences itself, as awareness manifesting all these uh, forms that are not separate from itself, it's part of its potential. However, you are not the only one perceiving in the universe. Consciousness is the only one perceiving in the only, universe. But it's, it is functioning through Rupert. Yes, but... But, but are you telling me Rupert is, is a separate self? No, I, I'm telling you, I'm suggesting to you yeah. that the knowing, yeah. and I mean knowing as like awareness, not a conceptual knowing, the yeah. knowing with which Rupert knows his experience doesn't belong to the body-mind called Rupert. It, yeah. it is itself infinite awareness shining in the body-mind of Rupert. Uh, it's not only shining, it, is, it makes out the it, body. Exactly. The exactly. body is nothing it, but exactly. the, the, the one way of saying the shining. Yes. However, you're seeing it from this angle, I'm seeing it from this angle. There are two eyes perceiving, needed for the perception. And are you saying, will you, will you say only the bodies are making that distinction? I think I'm, what I'm hearing is we again speaking from different perspectives. What Rupert is referring is the space when there is no actually space and time. So there is no distinction between one perception and another. No, I don't think so. I mean, Rupert is talking about perception. He is seeing you and everybody else. 
But I mean, as, as awareness, aware of all these things, but not seeing them as a part of itself. Yes. yes. Is it not possible that the perception that you're having, and the, that you are having, and the perception I'm having, and that, that the perception that all seven billion of yeah. us are having, are simultaneously appearing in, known by, and made out of dimensionless awareness? Oh yes, I, I definitely that's the case. Dimensionless awareness is the fundamental subject that is aware of all of these. Yeah. However, the the this the awareness of this fundamental perception, it operates, it perceives through organs it yes. is manifesting. To me, uh, yes, but but the organs that and it the, is manifesting. Otherwise, it will not have a perception. Yes, it's true. It has to appear as separate minds to have separate not perceptions. Sep no, I'm not saying separate minds. Well, okay, in, in, you know what I mean. Um, minds it that are not separate from itself. It, but it's it, like saying... Uh, well, that's why I call the word individual. Okay, it, individual. Instead, instead of it, uh, separate. It's like, to me, what I'm saying is that although it appears that the moon illuminates the earth, that there is no, there is no real moonlight. There's no such thing as moonlight. Moonlight is personal consciousness. The moon borrows its light from the sun, and it's true that the moon itself illumines the earth. It seems to be coming from the moon, but the moon is borrowing its light from the sun. It and there could be many moons all illuminating different earths. I, okay. but, but the I, sun, that, that is quite they understandable. all borrow their light That's from the same but sun. But we need to have the moons to have those reflections. And, and the what moons, are the, what are the moons? Well, the moons, this is the analogy yeah. breaks down, but the yeah. moons are created by awareness. A awareness modifies itself, takes the shape of innumerable minds in order to perceive innumerable worlds. So yes, a, a awareness needs to rise in the form of the mind, the perceiving yeah. mind, in order to perceive a world. But it is a single dimensionless awareness that rises as in an, an infinite number of minds and at any moment sees an infinite number of worlds. But the, each, of, e each, of the, each of those minds that sees each of those worlds shines with the light of infinite, borrows its then knowing from the infinite knowing uh, of awareness. It doesn't have to even do it that way, Robert. I, I can be the sun and see that I am the sun and the moon at the same time. Yes, but uh, the, right? the analogy doesn't... I am the sun and the moon at the same time. Exactly, yes. Right? I am yes. the sun, that is yes. the, the original awareness, and I am the moon, which is needed to refract that to have a, yes. a, a, to have he, exactly. But the a, moon in this case it, it is a modulation of the sun. It is e modulation. Each individual mind is is infinite it is awareness, a modulation of vibrating the sun. Oh, within I, itself, I agree with you. appearing as a, an infinite number of minds. Uh, I think it's a wonder, wonderful way of saying it that the moon is a modulation of the sun. However, the moon is not created except by the awareness itself. It's not an illusion. No, it, it, it's not an illusion. It's not an illusion. It's, it's, only, not a, a it's only an it's illusion if it forgets that it is, it, that it is made by if the it, sun. If it forgets, In it other becomes words, just a moon, yeah. then it becomes separate moon. Exactly. So right. that's why I said the separate self, fr from the point of view of the separate self, the separate self is an yeah. illusion, from its own point of view. Yeah. However, of course, the, uh, what the separate self is really made out of is not an illusion. It, it, it's made out of the only awareness there is. Yeah. Yeah. You see, so what you're saying is that the sun needs the moon for it to have perception. The sun needs to rise as the moon. Yes, the yes. sun needs to take yes. the shape of the moon For in order in order to seem to know something other than itself. Yes. Well, no, wait a minute. I'm saying <laughs> that, that the sun we, we, needs yeah. to rise as a moon to know itself and to know everything as an expression of itself. Yes. Yes. Perfect. I Not yes. a Perfect. Itself. Very exactly. But but the moon is needed to arise. It need to manifest the moon. And this moon that you're calling moon, I call individual consciousness. Okay, For me, the individual consciousness but, uh, is not mind also. Okay. Mind okay. is a capacity of the individual consciousness. Individual consciousness is pure awareness. 
pure cognizing awareness, but as individual. Well, and it is possible to have the recognition and the experience of that individual consciousness that is not simply an individual mind. Okay, but my next question for, for we another have conversation. To close the we are way we'll, over time. Okay, all right, okay. And, and you <laughs> were both exciting, right yeah. that we need really like a day for this conversation. <laughs> One hour is just or a week. scratching <laughs> the surface. Or also. Thank you very much for being here today. And perhaps we can continue this conversation later on. We are, we are, you. We are recognizing. We are recognizing we are the same sun. <laughs> yes. Aren't we? <laughs> Absolutely. We are the same exactly. sun. That's the important thing. Yeah. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you.